Hello, my name is Innocent Rugoho, and I am the FMS advisor for Lely Oceania. You are very welcome to our webinar, Optimizing AMS by Getting the Fundamentals Right, the Tips for Success in AMS. This is our fifth webinar in our Oceania webinar series. We are very lucky to have an expert, Ian Sawyer, as the presenter of this webinar. I'll just give you a brief background of Ian Sawyer. He is a ruminant nutritionist with over 30 years experience. Ian is a partner at Feedworks Australia and has qualifications not only in animal production, but also in business. He also holds an adjunct fellow at the University of Melbourne School of Agriculture and Veterinary Science, where he is a regular lecturer in the master's programs in animal production. I am now going to hand over to Ian. Over to you, Ian. Thank you, Innocent, and thank you to Laili for uh, the invite to participate in this webinar. I hope that everybody out there is uh, having a, a reasonable time as we make our way out of the COVID challenge and uh, we enjoy having a bit of a chat about uh, some of the forage aspects that apply to automatic milking systems as well as ordinary uh, milking systems. This chat sort of uh, originated after a discussion between uh, Innocent and myself just around forage quality more broadly and he asked whether we would be able to bring together some of those discussion points in a, a framework that applied uh, more to automatic milking systems application and uh, happy to do so. So thanks for tuning in. Here we have one of the wonderful uh, robots that Laylee produces and uh, great pieces of kit they are. I guess around today's discussion we want to make sure that we implement things around our forage quality to ensure that the the outcomes from our automatic milking system that we put in are realised more reliably and uh, that our returns and our investment are as good as they possibly can be. Uh, no great promises of magic today in terms of the things I can promise or uh, that I can bring forward to the discussion, more a revisit of some fundamentals and an understanding of just how important those fundamentals are to ensure that the amplification of happiness that the Laylee astronauts can bring is uh, certainly realised by anybody that's using them. Myself, when I look at dairy systems in Australia and New Zealand in our grazing based systems, I look at these things around success being driven off asset utilisation. And if I look at our assets, I see that our, our assets are land and cows. And on the left hand side, if I'm looking at an Australian style setup, for a couple of hundred cows, uh, milking you might have 70 to 100 hectares um, as a milking platform and upon that platform I will grow fodder. That is the aim of having that dirt as well as having the, uh, the dairy itself. That 100 hectares uh, is probably worth about 1500 bucks a hectare, which makes the farm worth about 1.5 million. My friends over the ditch in New Zealand uh, will be proud of both their, their All Blacks but also their land value, looking at 100 hectares worth probably uh, four times that amount. In an Australian circumstance, I might have equity anywhere from 40% to, you know, up towards 100%, 40% to 80% is what I list there. Um, if I have a 50% equity, it means that I have debt of $750,000 and I'm servicing $75,000 per annum to the bank. Over my 100 hectares, it means that I'm giving the bank 750 bucks per hectare per year in land cost. My second, land, my second asset is of course my cows. And if I have a couple of hundred cows and they're worth $2,000 each, I've got 400,000 bucks worth of cows. It's pretty evident there that uh, it's a smaller asset than the land, 25% you know, of, the, of the land cost. As a consequence, what we see in our grazing based systems when we look at success is an emphasis on land efficiency, an emphasis on growing and harvesting pasture and homegrown fodder on the land. Um, we wanna make the land debt work for us. We know that the banks lend on land, not cows, which is a difference to North America and some other parts of the world. But I would emphasize that cow efficiency, while sometimes not being seen as prominent, is still an important driver of productivity and profitability. And I'll try to bring together how cows and land need to be brought together for an effective outcome on either side of the ditch. 
We still need success in the cow to go with the land if we are going to have good feed conversion efficiency and conversion of homegrown fodder into milk solids. Let's look at the land asset. The greater the utilised tonnes of homegrown dry matter per hectare per year down the cow's throat, the better off we are. Um, we have this measure. Um, I think both sides of Australia and New Zealand understand the importance of utilised tonnes. I'm much more about utilised tonnes than I am grown tonnes because I know people that grow it quite well and don't get it down cow's throats anywhere near as effectively. Here in Australia, and I believe over in New Zealand, we can aim for one tonne per hectare per year per 100 mils of rainfall. And if we hit those sorts of numbers, we account for both the quality of the land and we account for efficiency in the use of that land. Um, clearly, when we're aiming for those sorts of things, we understand why fertiliser becomes important in the driving of our forage-based systems. Here in Australia, I have a lot of dairy country that only has 700 mils of rainfall. And in that sort of country, I would aim for seven tonnes per hectare per year down the cow's throats. If I've got a thousand mils of rainfall, I might aim for 10 tonnes per hectare per year down the cow's throats. If I've got 1500 mils of rainfall in certain parts of Tasmania or New Zealand, I want 15 tonnes per cow per year down the cow's throats. Not grown. If I look at cow asset utilisation, the goal that I would look for is one kg of milk solids per kg of cow body weight per lactation. That's a minimum, not a maximum, but a good place to aim. This level of output per cow will allow for the cow to be a good, efficient feed conversion machine, i.e. we are putting feed into milk fairly effectively, but it also will allow the cows to remain as efficient grazing machines. And we need those cows to be efficient grazing machines if the land is going to be efficient. It's quite possible to have cows go higher in solids per kg of body weight, no problems at all, but at least be aiming for one kg of milk solids per kg of body weight. So 550 kg black and white cow in Australia, 550 kgs of solids, 7,500 litres. 425 kg cow, 425 kgs of milk solids, a bit over 5,000 litres per lactation for a little brown cow along those lines or perhaps a Kiwi cross. Debt servicing and level of utilised tonnes per hectare per year has a direct impact on how our grass costs and therefore what our attitudes are. And we've got to embrace this sort of stuff if we want to understand making our systems a little more efficient and understand how we get into driving efficiencies out of all of our grazing systems, but particularly some impacts around um, the automatic milking systems. So if we have higher or lower debt, that alters the overhead burden on each hectare of land. Um, same thing applies to sort of levels of labour, of course. But that higher or lower debt has some very real impacts on the true cost of grown fodder. So if I have my $750 per hectare that I referred to two slides earlier, and I only utilise five tonnes per hectare per year, which is a typical number in Australia in our modest rainfall areas, then I will have $150 per utilised tonne of feed in debt cost. I'll have my growing costs on top of that. If I had that $750 and I am able to utilise 7.5 tonnes, then my, my cost in debt on every tonne of homegrown feed drops to 100 bucks a tonne. If I also then, or if I continue with that 750 and utilise 10 tonnes, I have half the debt cost per tonne of utilised feed that I started with. And if I can get to 15, I've got a third. 50 bucks per tonne of homegrown forage um, uh, in, in debt cost. My direct cost of growing grass goes on top of that. And in certain parts of Australia, that probably doesn't get below about 75 bucks a tonne. So we can look at our total grass cost, our total homegrown forage cost um, grazed in that sort of, you know, 125 bare minimum, probably up to 200 bucks a tonne um, for some people, um, grey stuff. And that is non-irrigated forage. So for those of you that are in Northern Victoria, you will know full well that there's no uh, water cost in that. So in red, I have a, a statement down there. Grass is not always cheap. And that is just a truism. I'm sorry, I don't believe that grass is always cheap because I live in a world where it clearly isn't. But grass can be cheap. And we should aim for it to be cheap if you grow and harvest plenty. 
The thing about growing and harvesting plenty is you won't be able to do that. You won't be able to grow and harvest plenty unless it's good quality because you won't get it down a cow's throat. And we're going to get into some aspects of forage quality, which is what the talk's about. So growing and chewing more grass is crucial to make the land asset perform. As you um, grow more and as you eat more, as I showed, your pasture gets cheaper. On top of that, as you grow more, you also carry more cows per hectare. Your milk output per hectare goes up and the land asset performs even better, than, uh, even better for you. And this tends to apply even when an individual cow production is fairly modest. And so that sort of explains why we often see three to four cows per hectare in Tasmania or New Zealand or other parts of temperate uh, you know, grazing based systems. Um, it drives us to a very land centric approach, not a cow centric approach, because we have to make the big asset work. This is especially so in New Zealand when your land's worth 40,000 bucks US, you know, 60,000 bucks Kiwi. Um, I would put to you as a nutritionist who is interested in cows, however, rather than an agronomist, um, that this process works even better with acceptable feed conversion efficiencies around one kg of milk solids per kg of body weight. The whole process works better when you've got that level of milk output per cow than it does at 0.8 kgs of milk solids per kg of body weight. So we should aim for efficient cows as well as efficient land, and we can have our cake and eat it too. How much grass can a cow eat? Because there's upper limits to how much homegrown forage you, forage you can poke into a cow. In my experience on our mainland of Australia, if I get around that 3.3 through to 3.6 tonnes per cow per lactation, or 11 to 12 kgs per head per day, every day of lactation, I've done a really good job on the mainland. You guys are gonna to say to me, oh, there's times in, in spring when I can eat 16 kilos of pasture. Yep, there are. And there's times in summer on the mainland when it's rough and tough and tumble and hot that you're not gonna get much more than eight or nine. So across a lactation, if you can average 11 or 12 on the mainland of Australia, you have done well. Um, that is because our forage quality is limited on the mainland, typically by heat, by summer, by lignification, by NDF gain, and we limit total dry matter intake in any given day um, for many months of the year. In New Zealand and in Tasmania, of course, we have less heat for a great deal of the time, less fibre, less lignin, and greater potential dry matter on a given day and across a lactation. And those, in those circumstances, you guys should be able to hit more than four tonnes per cow per lactation of homegrown fodder. But, you know, for a lot of the people I talk to, if I can hit 3.5, doing a good job, guys. So let's bring it all together on the mainland of Australia. I'm in a 700 mil rainfall, so I want to utilise seven tonnes. My cow can eat about 3.5 tonnes per lactation. So two cows to the hectare um, doing 550 kgs of milk solids. If I do that, and eat that homegrown fodder, I will need to purchase 1.7 tonnes of uh, purchase feed, um, typically in Australia grain paste feed, um, to top up to hit that 550 kgs of milk solids. And certainly in Australia, that's affordable. And I believe in New Zealand with our uh, exportable barley out of Australia, this will be affordable this year as well. Do that, you'll hit uh, 550 kgs of milk solids, uh, two cows to the hectare. We eat all the grass we can. So the land asset efficiency is good. We have the cows doing good feed conversion efficiency. So the cow asset efficiency is good. The revenue is solid. The expenditure is managed. The total cost of production per milk solid is low because we have diluted our overheads and we have maintained our revenue. It's a good model. I like it a lot and it's reliable in turning out profitability where I come from. So what are the things that drive both the cow and the land success. What's the underpinning fundamental? And guess what? It's forage quality. Um, somebody, I read somewhere, somebody said, you can tell how good your nutritionist is by how good the forage quality is, because forage quality makes nutritionists look good. And that's the true, true thing for me, and it's true for all nutritionists. Forage quality is first and foremost. And if there's a secret, it is to grow and harvest ample good quality forage by mouth or conserved because it makes the land and the cow asset work. High quality forage drives high dry matter intake in your lactating stock and your young stock alike. It underpins both growth in the young stock and milk output in the lactating cows. It underpins the land productivity. Um, it underpins the cow productivity. It is just the secret. 
uh, when Innocent and I were first chatting, we were going, okay, let's talk about, you know, uh, is there any tips or secrets and that sort of stuff? Well, it's pretty hard to go past forage quality as the underpinning secret to uh, of dairy success, and especially so when we start looking at it through the, the prism of automatic milking systems. Let's throw an example up, however. Let's look at um, the same paddock if we had it um, as a progression through a season from peak spring through to into summer. In peak spring, I might have 11 megajoule 40 NDF pasture. Um, that stuff might be 100 bucks a ton or 10 cents a kilo. If I leave it for three weeks, it'll be nine and a half megajoules and 50 NDF. And if I leave it for a bit longer, it'll end up being eight megajoules and 65 NDF. The price will still be the same. It'll still cost us 10 cents a kilo, and I tell you, that's the bare minimum it costs. Um, as I said to you, I believe it's it's a fair bit more expensive than that. Um, if I look at that, throwing that feed through a 300 kg heifer initially, I will change the potential dry matter intake that that heifer can take, take in based on the NDF. Um, as the fibre uh, is going up, the animal eats less. She's full in every case, but I go from 9 kilos of dry matter intake to 7 kilos of dry matter intake to 5.5 kilos of dry matter intake. My total energy intake per day goes down based on a drop in dry matter intake and a drop in how much energy is in each kilo. My growth rate goes from 1300 grams a day to 520 grams a day to 70 grams per day. And I'll tell you, 70 grams a day is not even noticeable. It's just, it's standing still. My days to gain the next 50 kilos start at 38 and make their way through to about a year and a half. Um, and my feed efficiency, i.e. how many kgs of feed it takes to put on a kilo of body weight moves from about seven through to 13, through to 70 plus. And I tell you, I don't want 70 plus kilos of feed to put on every kilo of body weight. That's very inefficient. What I want is the stuff more towards the left than at least in the middle. If I look at the cost to put on a kilo of that body weight, if I look at the feed efficiency starting at 6.8 and the feed efficiency moving to 13 to one or moving to 77 to one, and I have 10 cents a kilo on each of those kilos, then I'm putting on feed at either 68 cents a kilo, $1.30 a kilo, or $7.70. I promise you, having dry standing feed, the like of which is on the right hand side um, that I would call poor forage there, is never cost effective for either lactation nor weight gain. It's never cheap enough to make up for the fact that it just simply isn't very good. So I would like to have efficient, low cost gain in my heifers, and I'd like to have a low cost of production for my milk. Let's look at the milk. Let's look at an example from Northern Victoria, a few years back now, but uh, still, still relevant. This is a real case study. A couple hundred cows in a town called Kahuna in Northern Victoria, for those of you in New Zealand or in other parts of Australia. This guy was feeding eight kgs of grain in the drought period. Um, uh, sorry, not in the drought period, in the non-drought period, and he had ad-lib grazing, but uh, he was gonna stick with eight kgs. I've tried to account for the cost of water into this. Um, the megalitre of water up in that part of the world ranges from about $200 to $500 a megalitre. And when you look at the forage costs that I know, that I will use in the next little while, understand that those forage costs include both direct growing costs, uh, finance costs, and uh, water costs. So let's move on to that. I've got forage costs for good quality forage of 11 megajoules and 45 NDF at 27 cents a kilo. Um, that's accounting for a fair bit of water cost there. Alternately, I've got okay forage at 9.5 megajoules and 50 NDF or poor quality forage at 8 megajoules or 8.2 megajoules and 65. I've allowed for the cheaper stuff, or sorry, the worser stuff to be cheaper. But what I'm going to show you is that in spite of the fact that it gets cheaper, the cost of producing the milk has actually gone up. So if I look at feeding my eight kgs in the, in the, uh, the, the dairy, or in this, your case with the AMS, we'll be feeding them through the automatic milking systems. And I look at the potential forage intake. Um, please forgive me that I got hay, it was actually, uh, we're looking at it as grazing. It's 12 kgs for the good gear, it's 10 and a half for the okay gear, and it's eight kgs maxing out for the poorer quality stuff. In each case, these animals are full, but they're full at 20 kgs, 18 and a half kgs, or 16 kgs. The energy intake is 232 megs, or 200 megs, or 166 megs. Sadly, the maintenance and exercise requirement is unchanged. It stays at 70 megajoules per day, even as the megajoule intake drops away. As a consequence, the milk production moves from about 31 litres down to about 25 litres and then down to 18 litres. That has a fairly substantial impact on your revenue, I assure you. 
If I look at some of these costs, the forage cost actually declines um, in terms of how much is being spent per cow per day as I have less intake per day and uh, each kilo of forage being a little bit less expensive. So I've moved from $3.24 forage cost to $1.52 forage cost as I move from left to right. You might think that's a win. I myself think that's going to show up as a fairly big issue. Um, the grain cost stays at four bucks. The total feed cost is $7.24, $6.42 or $5.52. So we can say that total feed costs are substantially less on the right hand side. The challenge we face is that the milk income has declined by even more than the forage and feed cost has declined. So our margin, which is the margin of milk income minus total feed cost, there in red, declines precipitously as we move from left to right. And our actual cost to produce a litre of milk is actually cheaper on the left hand side when we look at how many litres of milk we're producing over our total feed cost. Now that guy on the, the right hand side with the poor forage could be saying, oh, well, I'm actually writing less checks or I've done, you know, I've got less outgoings. Cash flow is not just about outgoings. Cash flow is a two edged sword. It is revenue and it is outgoings and you cannot ignore revenue when you're considering cash flow. The business bottom line, if I have that margin of 660, 468 or 268 and I put it over a couple of hundred cows, I look at uh, the, the, uh, the, the darker numbers there, 13, 20, 9, 37, and 537. But then I put my other overheads, um, my financing costs, the amount of feed that I have to put towards having heifers floating around on the runoff block or dry cows floating somewhere um, have to be fed at some stage. And I look at my net margin per day and it is showing quite clearly that I am much better off with high quality forage being fed generously. My dry matter intakes are supported. My milk revenue is supported. I am in much better shape. If I allow myself to slip into that poor quality forage too early in the season, I will have dire consequences for my cash flow and my profitability of my dairy farming business. So where does all this fit for automatic milking systems? You still got to obey the fundamentals of asset utilization of land and cows. Automatic milking systems don't have a different set of rules. What happens now is we can amplify the impact of this either positively or negatively with our automatic milking system. And we do that because now we have to account for the cow's own willingness to move as part of that process. We want cows to come in and be milked. We want them to be motivated to do so. For success to follow, it's, it's paramount that the cows are willing to get up go get milked and then move through to the, to the next break, the next paddock, if you will. The incentive to do so might be because the cows like to get milk because they get some purchase feed while they, they're actually getting milk, but it should also be that there's the attraction of high quality forage on the other side of milking. Because if it's not an attraction of high quality forage, then they are not going to maintain their homegrown forage intake and your land asset utilization will fall away. If it's not the attraction of homegrown forage, then they'll become too reliant on purchase feed and you will find a substitutional effect, which I don't think is what most of us want in a grazing based system. Now, here's one of the uh, Laley clients in New Zealand and here's a man that understands high quality homegrown forage. I do not know this man, but I like, like his style already. Um, good on him, that is a beautiful sward, well managed, that stuff is 40 NDF, 11 and a half megs. It's, it's lovely stuff and cows are going to want to get up and be milked and get through to the next break of that. Um, looks to me like he's running it, um, you know, a, a nice system there. Good luck to you, mate. You're doing a top job. Benchmarking milkings per day, which we all know is an important benchmark through AMS systems, is, dri is it drives and is driven. Now, what does that mean? By this I mean that milking a cow stimulates lactational physiology. Getting her to come up and be milked, just be milked, drives the mammary gland to make some more milk. So, um, milking drives lactational physiology. Um, but lactational physiology is driven as well. Um, it is driven by nutrition very strongly. So if you have poor nutrition, 
you reduce lactational physiology and you reduce the amount of milk flow and you reduce the number of milkings per day. And if we allow poor nutrition to reduce that number of milkings per day and reduce the, the milk flow, we will see that we spiral rapidly out of control in an automatic milking system because both the cow asset and the land asset start being less productive. We do not want that. We have to keep milkings up. So therefore we have to keep the cow motivated. We don't wanna do that solely through purchase feed. So forage quality is really important. Forage quality is what keeps the cow going, and it's the cow going is what keeps the land going, and the land going is what makes all that land debt worthwhile. Low quality forage will therefore impede the success of a more automatic milking system. It's unreasonable to blame an automatic milking system if your forage quality is poor. Um, if you have that, your cows have low dry matter intake, and they're not keen to be milked. And if they don't get milked, well, you know, that's not the fault of the, the asset that you have recently invested in. These are good assets. Likewise, you can't blame the AMS if your forage quality is poor and the cow then starts being too reliant on purchase feed. Um, we do not want to have that happening either. You can expect good cow outcomes with AMS if you have high quality forage to motivate cow behaviour. Integrate plenty of grazing intake into your appropriate purchase feed to hit a high milk outflow. You can expect good land outcomes with AMS if you then harvest plenty of homegrown, high quality homegrown forage per hectare per annum. You bring your two assets together smoothly and beautifully and the AMS makes all of that work more happily because you don't have all the labor hassles of trying to make the fundamentals of milking cows each day just happen smoothly. So you can almost amplify the positives of an AMS or you can amplify the negatives with an AMS. And I guess that's one of the things that we chatted about with the Laley guys and myself just recently. And I quite like the way they brought that, you know, that to the thing. You amplify the good bits or you amplify the bad bits. Hopefully we're all amplifying the good bits. AMS can allow the smooth and simple integration of these principles of dairy production with lower labor costs. AMS can't overcome fundamental or structural failure of production system if the land asset is poorly performing or if the cow asset is underfed and not making milk. Um, you have to accept that there's some responsibilities that go into this that are independent of the AMS. So the risk we see, or I see, and some of my nutritional and consultancy mates see, is a low graze forage intake. Um, you, you want your multiple milkings per day, you want greater than two because that will favour um, plenty of milk outflow. Um, it can favour more purchased feed intake. We don't mind that. We don't mind if cows are getting milk plenty and they take in more feed while they're there, but we want it to go on top of high dry matter intake of homegrown fodder. It's got to be on top of not substitutional to high dry matter intake of homegrown fodder. If we find that we're reducing homegrown fodder um, in the face of more purchase feeds because the cows are not getting in and looking for that homegrown fodder because it's not high quality, then we've got to take some steps to address that. Um, there is some things that we can do around our supplement design and myself as a nutritionist and the smart guys that I talk to around um, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, uh, Ireland, the United Kingdom, Western Europe, we're all around our supplement design, designing the right forms, the total forms of starch, the right forms of energy, the right forms of protein that will allow animals to eat more forage in a grazing system and not impede uh, voluntary grazing um, or that will not impede the next mouthful of the TMR system. And we can take those approaches both within the TMR, the PMR, or in a gray system. And I promise you there's some stuff that we can do around starch and protein to, to overcome that. Chat for another day. Uh, quite a lot of detailed sort of physiology that goes into that, but there's some answers there. Another photo from New Zealand, you know, beautiful stuff. There's, we just wanna eat a lot of that gear. We spent a lot of money growing it and we're gonna spend a lot of effort making sure it gets down cow's throats. Now let's look into the world where we might not have grazing systems and we are looking at um, confinement herds and automatic milking systems. Uh, now there's a lovely herd of cows. I would say to you, there's gonna to need to be a push up um, occur in the not too distant future going down through there because you can see that there's a fair bit of that feed that is a long way out of reach of those animals. And we wanna make sure that uh, efficiency of feed consumption is maintained even in 
that sort of system, so we'll need to make sure the push-ups occur um, in a timely fashion. Um, confinement systems are a bit different to grazing, um, but we still have to have ration design going on, but there's still a need for homegrown fodder efficiency drivers around um, a confinement system. But instead of it being about you know, grown and harvested by mouth, we're now going to have a whole bunch of efficiencies around growing, harvesting, stacking, packing and feeding out. You know, mixing, mixability, uh, voluntary intake, all of those sorts of things. All of those drivers of land use efficiency have to be taken into account when we're doing a confinement system. But guess what? The land still has to be efficient. Um, the cows themselves have to actually hit new heights of efficiency if we're going to have a confinement system because by the time we spent that money on that capital, we really do need to be able to make sure those animals are churning out a lot of milk. And honestly, you know, in a lot of these, we want you know at least 10,000 litres per lactation. That's a lot of milk solids. Um, and you know, the more money we spend, the higher that production output has to be. But all systems must grow and provide ample homegrown fodder into that TMR in order for the land efficiency. And if you're going to do that via May silage, good on you. If you're going to do it via loosen, good on you. If you're going to do it by some other forage, also good on you. Cereal silage, big popular um, situation that's just growing and growing here in Australia. Good stuff. So any silver bullets? Um, no, there's not lots of silver bullets, but one of the tools that I do like to use um, in my world is a simple product called Diamond V that you know is used by 50% of the cows um, in the United States. So it's got a, a pretty well proven, proven track record. Um, great for forage digestibility, great for promotion of dry matter intake. Um, nice little bit of data uh, or a nice sort of uh, data set that comes out of it that suggests that um, there's about 90 grams of milk solids that come with the investment of uh, diamond V yeast metabolite. So that's sort of yeah, a pretty good investment. Not a silver bullet, just a handy tool if, it's, if you're going to look at something. And it seems to fit into both grazing systems here in Australia and uh, New Zealand and, and the TMR systems. Um, so my summary of advice. Um, Growing and providing high forage quality is the biggest secret in dairy. But guess what, it's no secret, guys. You know, I think we've all known it. Um, why does everybody try to produce high quality rye grass in New Zealand and in Tasmania and Southern Australia? Because we know we can eat more of it. It is especially important in automatic milking systems, however. Uh, it's like fitness in football teams. Um, to me, you know, if you look at it, for years, the All Blacks were just fitter than the Wallabies. And everybody knows that fitness just gets you over the line a bit better but not everybody's good at getting fit. Well, forage quality is like that. You know, everybody knows that forage quality is important. It's not everybody's good at producing forage quality. It is, however, within your control, so manage it. And it's especially important to maintain this within your automatic milking system setup because it promotes and amplifies the positive impacts of AMS and it promotes or amplifies some of the negatives if you don't get it quite right. So I would say at that particular point, um, you know, that's a, a good summary. Um, let's bring ourselves back into um, a last view of uh, the beautiful Laylee uh, system there. And we think we like to bring the best out of that. They're lovely bits of kit. Um, Laylee are a company that put an awful lot of effort into producing fantastic technology. So let's understand the manner in which we, we manage our forage will have a profound effect on how we produce the best out of these wonderful assets. With that, I will say uh, thank you to Innocent and to the Laley team. I would gladly say if anybody wants to forward through to the guys um, questions or queries or uh, happy comments or sad comments, please do so. And I would throw it back to Innocent and uh, say uh, thanks again. And we hope that uh, that uh, has met with, with uh, good ears. Bye now. Thank you, Ian. For further information and questions, please email us on lellyaus at lelly.com. Thank you very much for watching today. And on behalf of Lelly Oceania, I want to thank Ian Sawyer from Feedworks for his time and sharing his knowledge with us. Much appreciated, Ian.